One of the questions that I'm frequently asked is, what do I do if I take out a maxillary posterior tooth and after looking into the socket, I see the sinus membrane, or even worse, a hole in the membrane and I'm staring right into the maxillary sinus? How you handle this initially is extremely important. If you manage it correctly, everything will heal and there will be no problems. However, if you don't manage it correctly, the patient has a high chance of developing a chronic oral antral fistula, which will require at least one additional surgical procedure down the road in order to close the hole. This case demonstrates just that situation that I was faced with one day when I was taking out a maxillary first molar on a relatively healthy 52-year-old man. As you can see here, tooth number 14 is a distal bridge abutment and the tooth has been root canaled. And you can see that there's a fair amount of internal and external root resorption in the area of the furcation. So this radiograph is fairly consistent with a fracture of one of the roots. I'm going to begin by sectioning the bridge between tooth number 12 and the pontic of number 13. Remember, if we section the bridge between 13 and 14, that would leave the pontic cantilevered off of tooth number 12, which would not be very stable and ultimately lead to its doom. The bridge was sectioned using a diamond disc, and we pick up the action from that point. So we now have the 13 pontic attached to number 14, and we're going to start by going in with a spade proximator to try to mobilize the uh, number 14 a little bit. And then what I'll do is I'm going to go in with the forcep and see what I can get, just try to get the, uh, the crown and the pontic out of the way, and I'm left with the residual roots of uh, tooth number 14. So I've sectioned between the palatal and the two buccal roots, and I'm going to uh, accentuate that a little bit more so I can get a good split between the roots, and then I'm going to section between the mesiobuccal and the mesiodistal roots uh, in order to section and separate those two. Once I've done that, I'm going to come back with a 46R elevator and separate the three roots from each other and elevate them out. And you see first the uh, uh, distal buccal root is fairly loose. Go back in with the spade proximator, advance that down the periodontal ligament space in order to separate the PDL fibers and also to expand the alveolus a little bit. I've already elevated out the distal buccal root and I'm going to take a bayonet forcep and easily lift out the mesial buccal root since it's been mobilized using the proximators. And then finally I'll use the spade proximator to mobilize the palatal root which I can then just grab out with a curved hemostat. You may remember from the pre-op radiograph that there was a fair amount of resorption of root and bone in the furcation area and so when you get the roots out you're going to expect to find a fair amount of granulation tissue in that site. And you can see clinically that that is the case. You can see there's a fair amount of granulation tissue in the furcation area around the palatal root especially. And so I'm going in with a curette and trying to loosen that up as much as I can. A curved spoon curette works, but also a straight curette a lot of times will give you a little bit better leverage to get in there and uh, scrape against the bone edges on the inside of the socket. And then go back with the mosquito hemostat and get all that granulation tissue out. Once I thoroughly debrided the site, I flushed it out with some sterile saline and then took a look with a mirror. And what I saw was a small opening into the maxillary sinus. This was about a 3 millimeter bony defect and the membrane appeared to be intact. Since the site was clean, now I'm going to go in with a gel foam wedge and I'm going to stuff it into the palatal root to completely obturate that opening into the sinus. And then I'm going to put another gel foam on top of that so that it's completely filling in the socket and will hold the clot in place so things will heal uneventfully. In order to hold that in place, I'm going to use a figure eight suture using 3-0 gut suture. And remember, I'm going to pass that from inside to outside so that I don't displace the gel foam while I'm suturing and then go ahead and uh, securely tie that in place. The gel foam will hold the clot in place which will allow granulation tissue to form which will ultimately be replaced by osteoid so that the extraction socket will completely fill in with bone and the oral antral fistula will no longer be present. The patient was sent home with a prescription for amoxicillin 500 milligrams three times per day for five days and that was to prevent contamination of the oral bacteria into the sinus. Because you're not treating a primary infection of the sinus, you can actually use any antibiotic that covers the oral flora, such as penicillin, acephalosporin, or clindamycin. He was also given a sinus instruction sheet, which I'll go over in a minute, and he returned it one week postoperatively and basically had a very uneventful postop course. He had no complaints of any sinus pressure or pain or drainage and very minimal discomfort afterwards. This is the appearance of the extraction site at one week, and you can see that it's healing quite normally. 
So now to review a few things about oral antral communication. First is that the maxillary sinus dips the lowest in the area of the maxillary first molar, and so that's the most common site for an oral antral communication to develop after a tooth is extracted. The best way to treat an oral antral fistula is to avoid it in the first place, and the best way to do that is to remove the tooth as atraumatically as possible. If the tooth has fairly convergent roots, then a lot of times you can get the tooth out with just an elevator and forcep. However, if there are divergent roots, then it's going to be very difficult to do this without taking out some bone with it. So the best thing to do is to section the tooth into the three individual roots and elevate them out separately. If you see a fair amount of radiolucency around the roots, indicating either root resorption or bony erosion, expect there to be a fair amount of granulation tissue and have a high index of suspicion that this granulation tissue may extend beyond the roots themselves into the floor of the sinus. So when you're doing the informed consent process with the patient, be sure to point that out to them and show it to them on the radiograph so that if it does occur, it's not a surprise. In fact, they might even be expecting it. And if it doesn't occur, they'll be relieved and leave your office thinking that you're a fantastic surgeon. If you do notice a small oral antral communication when you take a tooth out, go in there and carefully curette out the socket. You want to be fairly aggressive but be careful at the same time because if you don't remove all the infected tissue that's in there, then there's a good likelihood that the extraction socket will not heal and that oral antral communication will persist. Once the socket's clean, I would stuff it as tightly as you can with gel foam or you can also use a collar plug. You don't need to use a bone graft, but if you prefer to do that, you can but in most cases it's not necessary. You want to put the patient on a few days of antibiotics to cover the oral flora so that you don't secondarily contaminate the sinus and cause an infection. And you want to send this patient home with a sheet of sinus instructions. And if you do those things, most likely the site will close up by itself, just like in this case. But if at two weeks after surgery it's not looking like it's improving, if you're not comfortable managing and eventually closing an oral antral fistula, then the best thing to do at that point is to refer the patient to your trusty oral and maxillofacial surgeon for evaluation and advice on the next step to take. A lot of times just by keeping the area clean and nursing it along the fistula will close up by itself however probably about 10 percent of these will need an oral antral fistula closure procedure which may or may not involve cleaning out the sinus as well. This is the sinus instruction sheet that I was referring to earlier, and this is what we give to patients when they either have an oral antral communication or we're doing a procedure in the sinus, such as a sinus lift. It first explains to them why there's an issue with the sinus and their surgery. Either the roots of the teeth were very close to the sinus floor or extended into the sinus, or because the surgery was actually in the sinus. We let them know when they eat or drink following surgery, they may get some liquid passing into the sinus and discharge from the nose, and they may also have some bloody drainage from the nose, and these are both normal, and they shouldn't become alarmed. In order to speed healing, we'd ask them not to create any suction by smoking or sucking on straws, because we don't want to create a pressure differential between the sinus and the mouth. For the same reason, we don't want them to forcibly blow their nose or clear their sinuses, that if they have to do that, they can do it just gently, and we'll generally recommend that they get some saline nasal spray such as Ocean or Air, A-Y-R, in order to soften the mucus so they, they can more easily get it out. We remind them of the importance of returning for all their postoperative visits. If they complain of any sinus pain or pressure and their medical history doesn't contraindicate their use, we recommend that they get some Sudafed or Afrin or Neosinephrine spray in order to decongest the sinus and nasal passages. And if they were prescribed antibiotics, to be sure to take those exactly as directed as well as any other medications that they're prescribed. So generally, by following these principles that I've talked about, a small oral antral communication that's noticed when a tooth is extracted can be easily managed, and the patient will generally heal uneventfully.